So we're going to walk through 1 Corinthians in bigger chunks than we'd look at. If I was going to preach on it, I'd probably have four or five sermons on this. If I was uh, preaching on this on Sunday mornings, one of the good things about looking at things in larger chunks like this is it allows us to better keep everything in its context so that we don't look at things outside of the real reason that Paul gave it. Don, I usually give Walonzo a couple of daily breads from that box under the table. Okay. All right. Okay, so, um, so normally we go through these in smaller chunks, but by looking at it in larger, uh, it will allow us to keep everything in context so we'll be able to see clearly how all of these sections all have to do with division. So the first sin that Paul deals with in the church of Corinth is the sin of divisions or being divisive. And to spice it up a little bit, I'm going to call this down with denominations, Uh, down with denominations, down with divisions in the church. And we're going to walk through the first half of Paul's teaching on divisions in chapters 1 and 2, which I believe look at why divisions are wrong, why you should not desire to have them in the church. And then I think the second half of Paul's teaching is looking at how we can avoid being divisive in the church. So that'll be how to protect our unity. So Paul's first going to establish why divisions are wrong, and then second, he's going to say, okay, Corinthians, here's how you can get out of them. So let's get down and throw down divisions and get down with denominations. All right, the first reason to get rid of divisions is that the first reason they're bad is you cannot divide the body of Christ. You cannot divide the body of Christ. And Paul talks about this in verses 10 through 15. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, And I am of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that none of you would say you were baptized in my name. Jesus has one body, and the one body that Jesus intends to have in this world is the church. So Paul's starting point is very simple, and that point is since Jesus died on the cross as one person, one body, you can't divide the body of Christ, Uh, and since we are Jesus' body here on earth, you are also not to divide Jesus' body on earth. So the body of Christ is one unit. So just by saying that you are of Apollos or of Paul, it doesn't make it so. We are all of Jesus Christ. There are no Paulites because Paul didn't die for anyone. There are no Peter-tistants because Peter didn't rise from the dead for anyone. Uh, I think this passage should actually be the biggest argument against Roman Catholicism because If Catholicism was right, it would be correct to say, I am of Cephas or I am of Peter, because that's basically the same as saying, I am of the Pope. Uh, But we are not to to divide the body of Christ based upon leaders or sects in the church. Only one died for us, and we should all walk under his banner. And Paul uses baptism here simply of a confirmation of this truth that we're not to divide the body of the Christ. In the same way that you were all brought into Christ by one crucified Savior, we were all brought into the church through baptism through one name. We are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. I think Paul's bringing up his own baptisms as a way to say, no one in the church can say, I'm in the club that was baptized by Paul. I was baptized by Paul and you weren't. So I'm part of Paul's followers and and you can't be. 
Uh, Paul's saying that's not how it works. Here at Grace Community Bible Church, whenever I baptize anyone, I baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, I do not baptize them in the name of Sean. Uh, Paul did not baptize them in the name of Paul. So in the same way that we were all uh, baptized under one name, we were brought into one body, uh, that is how the church to be should be. We should not have divisions because you cannot divide up the body of Christ. And that is illustrated both by the fact that Jesus died in one body and that we are baptized in one name, that is Jesus Christ. The second reason divisions are bad is they are contrary to the gospel. They're contrary to the gospel. Now, I believe that all the rest of Paul's arguments against the divisions are all based upon the same basic principle. And that principle is that the, the reason we have divisions in, our, in the church, the main reason that we are divisive, is a result of pride or the sin of pride in our hearts. So all the rest that Paul's going to say is really designed to, to humble the Christian so that we won't be in the position where we boast over other people by saying, hey, all of my beliefs align with Paul, and we all know that Paul was the best missionary to the Gentiles. We wouldn't even have the gospel if Paul didn't first bring it to us. Or then somebody else saying, oh, but I, I follow Peter. And don't we all know that Peter was the only one who walked on water? And then you have someone else who boasts and says, Haha, you're calling on Peter and Paul. I am leaning on Jesus himself. Uh, we shouldn't boast over who it is that follows us because nothing should humble the Christian more than the way of salvation or the way of entrance into the church or being part of the family of God. Because Paul says that from the world's perspective, the cross is, well, let's just listen to what Paul says is the uh, world's view of the cross or the gospel. So 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And I'll skip down to verses 21 through 24. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews asked for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To Jews, a stumbling block, and to Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So Paul is trying to highlight here how divisions are a worldly thing. It is the world who boasts in following one scholar or one philosopher. The Jews are fighting over whose camp you're going to be in, the Pharisees or the Sadducees. But in the world's eyes, the cross is not something to boast over. The cross is not something to want to desire to be in. But the cross is humiliating. The Jews see the cross as a stumbling block because they would say, cursed is any man who hangs on a tree. And how could you follow a Messiah who hung on the tree? If the priests rejected Jesus, we must reject Jesus. The Greeks see the cross as foolishness because it lacks their wise philosophies and it's not based upon their fascinating logical arguments. The cross is insanely basic. A uh, few things are more basic in this world than the gospel. We are sinners. God is holy. Our sin has separated us from our holy God. And because of our sins, we need someone to bridge the gap between us and God. And that is Jesus. And Jesus bridged that gap by dying in our place. And he rose from the dead to provide eternal life to all those who believe in Jesus Christ. You don't need to be a great philosopher in the church like Tim Keller to share the gospel. It is super basic. John 3.16 is all you need. And the basic nature of the gospel itself, it calls us to humility. The gospel calls us to not boast over our wisdom, to be in this group or in that group. And if we are boasting over what we have in the church because our knowledge, our wisdom, our view is superior to someone else, it's a sign that we really don't understand the nature of the gospel. The nature of the gospel is childlike faith, that my kids, when they turn 
five, six years old. At that age, they could understand the gospel. They could understand they do things wrong before God and they need a Savior to save them from their sins. This is not rocket science stuff. And so having divisions based upon, I'm leaning on Apollos' greater um, preaching ability or Paul's greater writing ability, that's showing that you don't understand the gospel itself. The third reason divisions are bad is that they are contrary to the nature of the church. We see this in verses 26 through 29. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. And so Paul is saying, when you look around at the membership of the Corinthian church, what you do not find a lot of is a lot of wealthy and influential people. Now, as we go through the book of Corinthians, we're going to see that there obviously are some wealthy people in the church. There are some influential people in the church. But Paul is saying that when you look at the majority of the church, we got slaves. We got impoverished. We got day-by-day workers. We are not the best and the brightest of Corinth. Based on the world's standing, the church is made up of fools and idiots and the impoverished and the influential. The church is not the in crowd. Because if you think about what the church is, the church is the one place where every person needs to, to basically the, the one thing that's required for you to come in to be part of the church is you need to say, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. This is not the place where we come together to say, well, let me show off all the wonderful things that I've been doing for the last week or the last month. I want you all to know about how obedient and how righteous I am. No, we're to be the group that says, we need Jesus because we can't do it on ourselves. So this encourages the lowly and the needy to enter the church. And we see in Scripture throughout that God delights in saving the weak and saving the shameful. If you look at those whom God chose to be in his plans in the Old Testament, uh, constantly God is choosing the weakest and the most shameful. Uh, He picks Abraham, a a nobody from Ur the Chaldeans. He picks Gideon uh, to lead the people as one of their judges. And what was Gideon doing when God picked him? But Gideon was, was hiding. Uh, He did not want anybody to know what he was doing. His first acts of courage take place in the middle of the night. And then the whole point with Gideon laying down the fleece was Gideon's way of saying, God, I'm afraid. Uh, Confirm to me that you are choosing me. So God does not pick the weak, the strong, and the powerful, but God takes great pleasure uh, in choosing those who uh, most of the world would consider to be the most shameful. Uh, I believe the majority of people uh, that come to the to the receive food from our church's food pantry are Christians. They believe in Jesus for salvation. Based on my conversations with them, they believe the gospel. Uh, but some of those people who believe the gospel are are humiliatingly poor. And one of the sad things is some of the other people who come to receive food are are shockingly rich. They are taking advantage of the food that are being given that we are setting aside for the poor. And regardless of what side you're on, Paul says, you can become part of the church. So we are not to be divided based upon our income levels or our knowledge or our wisdom, but the church is to be one body. We're to look at every person and say that they are our brother, they are our sister. So Paul is saying here in this point, just look around at the people in the church. Just look at who's here. We're not, you know, the 40 most influential people in the city of Corinth. We're the weak. We're the lowly. We shouldn't boast in our standing. We should only talk about how blessed it is that we are all part of one family of God. So divisions are bad because they are contrary to the church. The fourth reason divisions are bad is that Christian leaders are nothing to boast over. Uh, Look at verses 1 through 5 of 1 Corinthians 2. And when I came to you, brethren, 
I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. So Paul describes now what he was like when he first arrived in Corinth. And Paul says, I was stumbling over my words. My, my, my knees were, were knocking together. No one would have looked at me the way I showed up in Corinth and said, this man is a wonderful order. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago, but Paul had gone through a lot of rough failures right before he arrived in the city of Corinth, and it was showing. So in the context of which Paul is saying this, Paul is saying, you need to understand, I am nothing to brag about. And so Paul was specifically directing this at himself, but you know he could easily have directed this at Peter. He could have said, why are you staking your claim to Peter? It's, it's the stories are all around the church at this point. We know all of the ways that when the disciples were together, Peter stuck his foot in his mouth. Peter did the wrong thing. Peter denied Christ. Peter is not someone to boast as well. I wish we knew more about Apollos so we could talk about the ways Apollos, somebody wasn't someone to boast over, but I'm sure if we got into his life more, we would discover that. Uh, Paul is saying none of these people saved you in their power. You were only saved in the power of God. Here's the thing about staking your name and your beliefs to any person or any group outside of Christ and his work, and that is any time, any time in your life, that you take the time to dig into the lives of any Christian or Christian group, you will always find something in that person's life, life where you're like, oh, I don't want to claim that person. I don't want to lean upon them. I had a little while in my beginning of my pastoral ministry where I was borderline obsessed with Martin Luther, John Calvin, and Zwingli. I was reading all their writings. I was reading biographies about their lives. Uh, and while I knew that Martin Luther would probably never want to work with me in a church due to my views on baptism and the Lord's Supper, I just could not help but love that prickly, chubby little monk. Oh, I thought Martin Luther was the great, was the greatest. And then I decided to fill in my gaps on Reformation history by reading about the Anabaptists especially reading about the life of Menno Simons, who was their leader. And when I read about how Calvin and Luther, Zwingli probably would have gone with him as, along with him as well, but Zwingli had died uh, before the Anabaptists really started to spread out. Uh, but what Calvin and Luther did to the Anabaptists and their people, it was awful. It was appalling. Uh, during the Counter-Reformation, the Reformers were just as cruel and harsh toward the Anabaptists as the Catholic Church was toward the Reformers. And I'm reading this thinking, ah, I would never want to say I was a Lutheran or a Calvinist because of what they did to the Anabaptists. And then you read about the Anabaptists if you want to side with them, and there were some groups in the Anabaptist overall umbrella name where you were like, those people are crazy. Like, they had some of the most insane views. This is why people really immediately dismiss Anabaptists is because there were smaller Anabaptist groups who just believed some things that were like, man, uh, I, don't, I don't want to claim that at all. And so Paul is saying here, no one should want to be a Paulite. No one should want to be a Peterson because Christian leaders are not worthy boasting over when you look at any denomination, any group in America of churches, you always end up seeing things in those groups where you're like, oh, I can't believe they allowed that to flourish. I can't believe they continue to allow that to happen. As Protestants, it's easy for us to look down at the Catholics because all of their scandals with the priests and molestations, but we got just as many issues in our Protestant denominations as well. Christian leaders are not people to boast over. So we should not divide over our favorite pastors or teachers, our authors, because in comparison to the power of God, 
they are weak, and they are feeble. And so Paul is saying, I showed up in weakness, I showed up in trembling, because I didn't want any of you in there to sit around and say, wow, look at Paul. Paul is awesome. Paul is saying, I want all of you to say, God is awesome. We need to lean on Jesus Christ and not on the apostle Paul. The fifth reason that divisions are bad is that unity is a sign of maturity. And so if unity is a sign of maturity, then not being unified is a sign that you're childish. And we see this in verses 6 through 9. Yet we, do not sp- yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Paul is speaking here about wisdom when it comes to the issue of divisions and that the only people who are going to get the wisdom of unity are those who are mature. I love how Paul contrasts the mature with the rulers of this age. That is, Paul is saying, the mature are going to get what I'm saying. If you're a mature believer, you're going to take in what I'm saying in these first four chapters about divisions, and you are going to run with it. But you know who probably wouldn't get what I have to say? That is the ruler's of this world. Because if the rulers of this world had any wisdom, you know what they wouldn't have done? They wouldn't have crucified Jesus Christ. Instead, they would have This is an important point that Paul's making, contrasting Christian maturity and wisdom against worldly rulers and authorities. Because from a, one, from a young age, Uh, One thing that I think we automatically end up assuming is that the rulers, the presidents, the prime ministers, the governors, the CEOs, all of those people must be really wise. Since they're in positions of power and authority, they got to have a lot of wisdom. And we have adults who continue to think that way. Since he's an accomplished person, he must be wise in everything that he does. I read a story this week about how in the 1960s, Civil rights leader Zandu McKissick was a bold leader in the civil rights movement. Uh, Zandu had accomplished a ton all across the country as it relates to the rights of African Americans. Uh, But McKissick wanted more. McKissick wanted reparations, and he was trying to think about the best way to get reparations to African Americans who had been damaged by current laws of that time period, and he thought the best way to do it was for the federal government to fulfill an initial promise that was made to free slaves that they would give them 40 acres and a mule. And so he thought, you know, the best way to do this is let's start a city. Let's start a town that is designed to build up, to encourage, to financially help those who had been harmed by civil rights issues during that time period. So we will give out the reparations that were needed by founding this city. And he ended up getting a lot of funding from President Richard Nixon. He got state governments, the federal governments all behind him. And so they created this this town on the border of North Carolina and Virginia. And it was called Soul City. And they thought Soul City was going to be a utopia for African Americans in the South. Millions of dollars were poured into the city. People started to move in. Homes were built. Everyone was thinking this city was going to be a roaring success. And then Soul City fell apart. Why did it fall apart? Because it turns out McKissick and his supporters, while they were really accomplished at getting civil rights laws passed and working in that category, when it came to running an actual city, they knew nothing. 
So when it came to the very basics of planning roads, setting up infrastructure, you know, the things that we all need to make a city livable, they were completely ignorant. They were like immature children when it came to building a city. And what the Washington Post called as the most vital experiment in American history, it failed miserably because the people who started it had a dream, but they didn't have the wisdom to put it into action. And when it comes to life in the Spirit, life in the church, we need to all recognize that before the Spirit, before God, with the wisdom of man, that doesn't bring anything to the table. It doesn't help us here in the church. We are all ignorant children before God's wisdom. We are desperate for the Holy Spirit and what He provides. So just because someone may have the expertise in worldly leadership, it doesn't mean that they'll have anything to help us here in the church. We can only walk according to the Spirit's leading and according to the Spirit's guidance. And what that requires is a lot of humility. It requires humility to say, my understanding, my thinking about things that I'm bringing to the table, it's all flawed. And so I need to... to, throw away all of my wisdom. I need to go to God's scriptures. I need to lean on the Holy Spirit. And I need to say, God, I need you to lead me and I need you to guide me. And we have one more point on why divisions are bad. And that is basically the opposite of this one that we just covered. And that one is in 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For he who has known the mind of the Lord, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, sometimes these verses are taken as proof that the unsaved are incapable of believing or accepting or understanding the things of God's Spirit. This is why the unsaved can't be saved until they first have the regenerating work of the Spirit, and then after that, they can put their faith in Jesus. Because without the Spirit, the unsaved are incapable of understanding or believing the gospel. But we need to understand that in the context context here, Paul is not contrasting let me, let me say that again because I'm context and contrast. I was, I was struggling over this. Paul is saying that he is not contrasting the unsaved rejection of the gospel against the saved person belief in the gospel. So the context here is not about the gospel and those who can believe it and those who can't. But what Paul is instead is contrasting two groups of Christians. Paul is contrasting the natural or the carnal Christian who seeks divisions in the body of Christ against the spiritual Christian who has the mind of Christ and seeks unity in the body. Divisions are a sign of carnality. Divisions are a sign of worldliness. So Paul is saying that you people who are living in your little sect, you're breaking up in your little group, Those who are saying it's all about listening to Apollos' teachings because don't you know Apollos has the best teaching ministry? Or don't you know how amazing it is to follow Peter? Uh, Peter is the one that Jesus told, feed my sheep. You know, so we got to get Peter's feeding and his food. That if you talk that way, you are rejecting the spirit and the mind of Christ. Because Christ is seeking unity in the body. The one who is walking in the Spirit, the one who is appraising all things, he is the one who's saying, I'm not just going to follow this guy in comparison to that guy. He's also the person who's going to say, I'm not going to be concerned if you're going to judge me because I'm closer to what Paul says than I'm closer to what Apollos says. If you're going to judge me for that, fine. It doesn't really bother me because the judgments of others isn't what I'm concerned about. You know who's concerned about the judgments of others? Those who struggle with pride. If you have a real struggle with pride, then you're always concerned about what other people think about you. 
But if you don't care about what other people think about you, that should be a sign of humility. Because what we're concerned about is the judgment of God over our lives and not the judgment of men. So what Paul is saying is that when we create unnecessary divisions in the church, all we're doing is living like the world. Those who are divisive in the church are carnal, they are natural, they are not spiritual or walking according to the Spirit. Now, I want to say this does not mean if you are a worldly or a carnal Christian that you are completely devoid of Christian character, that you are wrong in every aspect of your life. I think there are a lot of Christians who, on this issue, they are worldly, they are carnal. They are all about their divisions and their little sect and their little group and making sure, oh, I, I'm, I'm only in the Southern Baptist church and listening to Southern Baptist pastors and Southern Baptist teachers, and if you're not part of my convention, I don't want to have anything to do with you. We have those obsessive people, and they're carnal in those areas. They're worldly in those areas, but they could also be really godly in other areas of their life. They could have a wonderful prayer life. They could have a great testimony sharing with other people the gospel of Jesus Christ and the importance of believing in Jesus for faith. But when it comes to this issue of how you treat the body of Christ, they are worldly and they are carnal. And I think we always need to understand that this could be the way in all of our lives. We could have a way where we're, we're not divisive at all. You know, we are, are totally open to per, pursuing unity in the body of Christ But then in another area of our life, I mean, just thinking of the issues that are dealt with in Corinth, sexual sins, uh, the way we treat the poor, uh, the way we abuse spiritual gifts, you could be carnal or worldly in another area. So just because someone is a Christian does not mean that they won't be worldly or carnal in various areas of your life. And just because you've fallen in one area doesn't necessarily mean that you've fallen in all of these other areas. But one thing that Paul is saying is clear is that if you are a divisive Christian, if you're breaking everybody up into all of these little groups, it means that you are a worldly or a carnal Christian. And our goal should be is that we are a church who avoids divisions. We avoid divisions because you cannot divide the body of Christ. We avoid divisions because they are contrary to the gospel. They are also contrary to the nature of the church itself. We're not going to divide over Christian leaders because Christian leaders are nothing to boast over. And also because unity is a sign of maturity and divisions are a sign of immaturity. So we will uh, look next week at chapters 3 and 4, the second half of divisions, and we'll look there at ways to avoid divisions in our own lives now that we've seen clearly why they are sinful and something to be avoided.